right, so this is Unit 7, and what we're going to talk about in this video will be the first day of notes, which includes particles in motion, okay? In your notes packet, it is particles in motion both day 1 and day 2. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with recalling certain criteria that we learned prior to this unit. A particle moves along a horizontal line so that its position at any time that is greater than or uh, equal to zero, basically at any um, t is equal to zero or positive time value, this right here will be my position function. Now you should realize right now that I am highlighting um, and the way I'm going to highlight is I'm going to choose to just use one color as much as possible. If I do need to emphasize certain things, I'll use maybe like the, the neon green, but for the most part I will use this color here. Just follow the highlight so you know where I'm at. So this is my position function right here that I just highlighted, and it's measured in meters per second. Okay, so. Part A says find the velocity at time t and at time t is equal to one second. So what it's saying first is find it in terms of the variable and then specifically find it by plugging in one for t. All right, so finding the velocity function, if I know the position function was given, is simply going to take the derivative. So s prime of t, otherwise known as the velocity evaluated at any given time, is going to be just the derivative, and this is just going to be power rule, basic function um, stuff, where it's going to be 6t squared minus 14t plus 4, okay? Now, it said to examine it not only in variable form, but also plugging in one. So if I plugged in one basically where these t's are at in 6t squared minus 14t plus 4, it's going to yield a value of negative 4 meters per second. Again, don't forget that when you are given units, you definitely want to use them. All right, so negative four meters per second. This is the velocity at whenever your timer, if you will, is at one second. Now, something that I want you to, to know is that looking at negative four meters per second, the negative is important, the four is important, and the units are important. The negative will tell you the direction, and that's what we're getting into right now with particles in motion. When, uh, like part B, it says when the particle is at rest, when it's moving to the left or when it's moving to the right. Now the way I want you to, these are basic rules of interpretation when it comes to particles in motion, is that, now I'm going to go with the highlighter of green, when the velocity is zero, something happens. When the velocity is negative, something happens. And when the velocity is positive, something happens. And the following happen, I don't, I don't feel like I need to highlight, I'll just read it um, where it's at. So the velocity, whenever it's zero, this first column, it's basically when it's not moving. We all know that if something doesn't have a velocity, it's not moving. It's just stagnant. It's stand, standing still or just sitting there. And when this occurs, it's basically finding the zeros of the function of this velocity function that we solved from part A. Okay. So when I set that equal to zero, you can see the work over here off to the right. It's setting it equal to zero. And I'll go ahead and highlight this part. I set it equal as the velocity. I divided the entire right side by a GCF of 2, so that I could kind of simplify it a little bit lower. Um, I just found a mistake just now. It is 3t squared minus 7t plus 2. And therefore, when I factor it out, the 3t squared minus 7t plus 2, I get the following. The 3t minus 1, and also the t minus 2. The zeros of those function are, of course, what you see, one-third and at two. This right here is whenever these seconds over here are showing that it is not moving because of the fact that it is equal to zero. Now, if I'm less than zero or otherwise negative in the second column, I'm basically interpreting of moving left, backwards, or falling down, all meaning the same thing in regards to revolving, the revolving around the fact that the velocity is negative. Okay? And last but not least, the third column. If the, if the velocity is positive, I'm to interpret like right on a graph, forwards like in real life, some, someone walking forward, or throwing upward like, uh, like, I don't know, shooting an arrow upward, that velocity as it's traveling upward would have a positive velocity. Okay? A little reminder from related rates, which it has been a little bit 
it's been a little while since related rates. When something is negative, it's going to be decreasing in amount. Okay, so when that velocity is negative, it's decreasing of some sort, and that's what we're basically trying to interpret. When the uh, ve uh, velocity is positive, it's increasing in some sort. Now, there are a little bit of interpretations that extend a little further than what I just said in regards to these last criteria. We're going to talk about that. It's not dealing with velocity, but it's dealing with speed. Okay, and we'll talk about that here in just a bit. So it says, when is the particle moving at rest? Well, we already know. It's moving at rest right here when time is one-third and two seconds. When is it moving to the left? Well, I would say it's moving to the left on this interval right here, one-third to two. Okay, so that is an interval. And if I were to go to the picture, it's basically showing where that velocity is negative. So one-third all the way to two, that's where the velocity is negative. Okay, notice that I did put open parentheses here and here because I'm not including those parentheses. I'm not including the endpoints because remember, at one-third and two, that's whenever my velocity is zero. Okay. Okay, and the last part says moving to the right. So again, my velocity is positive. So from the graph over here, you're going to see that the velocity is positive everywhere to the left of one-third and everywhere to the right of two. So I would put it as the final answer is, let me highlight this one, is going to be from zero to one-third and from two to infinity. What I want you to take a look at is the way I put zero. Okay. The reason why I close the bracket on zero is because if you notice in our original question, way up here, it said when it was t was greater than or equal to zero. That's why I closed it here at the very bottom. Okay. Basically, it's you start your stopwatch at zero seconds, and as soon as you start it, this particle is already in motion. It had already been in motion prior to you beginning your stopwatch. Okay, So the fact that zero, which if you were to look at this number line, exists somewhere around here, has a positive sign, you know that it's already moving to the right, forward, or basically throwing upward in that um, interpretation. Okay, Let's now go to the next page, or the next part. And it says, a particle moves along a horizontal line so that its position, again, this is still the same question, only we have part C, D, and E. Okay, so C says, find the acceleration, first of all in variable form, and then plug in one for T and, and actually see the numeric value, what is the acceleration at one second. All right, so if this is our position function, it's basically deriving twice so that we can get all the way down to its first derivative, or sorry, to its second derivative. Okay, so if I derive twice, it's basically I could take the answer that I got from part a of that 6t squared minus 14t plus 4, and I could just do the power rule again to get the 12t minus 14 by itself. So this right here is my equation as far as my acceleration, and notice how I wrote it. You can write it one of three ways. You could say s double prime of t is equal to the following 12t minus 14 or v prime of t or finally just a of t. Notice the differences as far as s double prime showing the acceleration, v prime showing the acceleration and just a of t with no prime whatsoever all standing for and representing the acceleration function. Plugging in the one basically where the t is at I would get an answer value equivalent to negative two meters per second squared. Now, meters per second squared, if you don't know it already, the acceleration is different from the velocity and the fact of it saying in meters per second, per second, okay? <clears throat> it's like saying every second that you're changing, you're changing at that velocity um, rate. So if you're changing and you're taking the derivative of that velocity, just a reminder, it's gonna be at that meters per second squared, okay? So it says, find the displacement on part D of the particle between when t is equal to zero, time is equal to zero, and time is equal to three seconds. And explain the meaning of your answer. Okay, so this is a huge word right here that I'm gonna highlight, it's called displacement. Some of you in physics, you probably have already been 
um, exposed to this and you know what displacement truly means if you are not in physics this is what it basically is, is describing it's describing the change in position okay so let's say that I'm standing in my room and I walk forward 10 feet and then I come back to my original spot walking backward 8 feet so let me let me paint the picture for you so I'm standing right here <clears throat> and I walk forward 10 feet but then I walk backward and all the time my eyes are facing forward okay so even when I'm over here I'm still facing to the right if you will so let me put a little hair over you will and I'm walking that way okay so if I walk forward 10 feet but then I walk backward okay still looking forward but I'm walking backward eight feet my displacement has been a positive two feet so the positive two feet is representing what distance positive or negative am I away from my original position so it's the change in position now up until this point change has been um, affiliated with derivatives and primes and deri uh, taking derivatives of functions but change in position means here it's just the difference okay so how do we see that as an equation we're going to look at it at this equation right here displacement is the final position minus the initial position we're going to talk about that here in just a bit okay but the the main thing that i want you to understand it's going to involve the initial and it's going to involve the final and the equation that i want you being able to recall is the displacement is equal to the final minus the initial okay so it says we want to find the displacement amongst these two times so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna say well what's my initial and what's my final well if I start at time 0 you see this is why I have initial written right here and if I will end at time is equal to three seconds this would be my final as, as far as being interpreted as my final time okay so I'm gonna put in 0 and 3 both into the position function because it's the change in position. So the position function is way over here and it's going to be s of t. So it's going to be s of 3 in this case is equal to 8 meters. Okay. Remember what each level of function represents. In this case it's representing meters. Not meters per second, not meters per second squared, but meters because it's the position. I then plug in 0 because I want to use my initial and I'm going to plug it into s of t and when I plug it in I get 5 meters so my initial position was 5 meters so let me highlight that real quick okay and my final position was 8 meters and if I go straight to it's the final minus the initial it's basically going to be 8 minus 5 I'm going to get a positive 3. And this does count in effect as far as when things are supposed to be interpreted as negatives, because obviously if I did 5 minus 8 instead of 8 minus 5, I would get negative 3 instead of the positive. Okay? This is a positive 3 meters displacement from the initial position. Sort of like what I did with this example up here. I was positive 3 units away from my um, 3 feet or 2 feet in this example. Um, away from my initial position, whereas this one yields a 3 meters positive direction from your initial position. Alright, so it says find the distance traveled by the particle between t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 3 seconds. This is part E. Your steps, when you see distance traveled, okay, so let me highlight this because this is also a key word. Distance traveled is total distance traveled, okay? So if it's total distance traveled, it's basically saying, back to my original um, example over here, displacement would be 2, but the total distance that I traveled was not 2. It was first 10, so from my original, it was 10, and then from here, it was back 8. 18 would be my total distance traveled. Now the way you do that are the following four steps. It's the forward and backward, if you will. You're going to look for changes in direction. That's step one. That means you're going to identify the zeros of the velocity function. OK? 
okay so you're looking for the changes of direction using that first derivative test if you will you're going to see when something is moving backward or forward based upon the signs of their derivatives again negative meaning backwards positive meaning forward if the derivative is zero it's not moving okay step two find the displacements on each interval we're going to find the displacements with this equation right here the final minus the initial positions of each of those intervals and I'll show you uh, picture wise here in just a bit what that looks like step three take absolute values of it well why do we want to take an absolute value well the reason of it is is if I added 10 and I said I walked backwards 8 so I put a negative 8 I would get a total distance traveled of 2 but that doesn't make sense I have to absolute value all these individual pieces so that I see a positive 10 and a positive 8 because whether I'm walking backward or forward, a total distance travel, traveled is accounting for everything, forward and backwards. Okay, And then, of course, the last step is just add them all up. Okay, So let's go ahead and look at this, what, what your work would look like. Step one, we're trying to find the change of the direction. So I'm going to find the derivative, basically the velocity function, and I'm going to set it equal to zero, and by setting it equal to zero, um, and solving for t, way back here, we found them to be at one-third and two were the zeros when we first took that derivative. Okay, So one-third and two were my zeros of the function. So one-third and two are zeros. This is when the, when the first derivative is equal to zero. So we can call these critical points. Okay, so why are 0 and 3 critical points? Well, 0 and 3 are critical points because of the fact of we're interpreting it like candidates test, where you're interpreting 0 and 3 right here in the question in part E, you're interpreting them as the actual endpoints. Now, we all know endpoints are non-differentiable because you don't have the wings, if you will. You don't have local linearity where it's approaching both sides of a point. So because of that, we can kind of interpret it like a cusp or a vertical tangent, any of those things to where we know it's going to be non-differentiable. So that's also a critical point because of its being undefined. Okay, So those are undefined, still being critical points, whereas these were because they were equal to zero being critical points. Okay, Just a little recap on candidates test. Now, remember, I wanted to know what was the distance traveled. My second step is to find the displacement on each interval. So when I show you these, each of these intervals, I have 0 to 1 third, 1 third to 2, 2 to 3. So if I want to see the change in positions, well, I'm going to find out what is S of 0. Okay? So S of 0 would yield 5. If I plugged in 0 into the original um, S sub t function that we have here back here, it would yield a value of 5. If I plugged in 1 third into the original position uh, function, it would yield 5.629629. Now I'm going to be working with decimals and any time throughout a problem, just as before suggested, is for you to use at least six decimal places as you're working throughout the problem. If not, just save your work in your calculator as far as storing it like an actual exact value. Okay, So this would be s of 2 is equal to 1 and this would be s of 3 is equal to 8. Okay, I've just found their positions and if I want to find their displacement that's what I'm about to do is I'm about to do steps 2 and 3. Steps 2 and 3 is to find the displacement on each interval and to take the absolute values. So how did I get 0 0.629629? What I did was is I took the final because it was at one third, which comes, of course, after zero seconds, and I'm going to subtract five. So 5.629 minus five gives me that. Okay, that is step two. The step three part is, and I'll highlight it in, in a different color, is to take the actual absolute value of it. Okay, and you'll see why here in just a bit. So let me do the step twos on the other intervals. So the step two again is going to be that displacement, and here it's one minus my previous 5.629629 and it's going to be giving me a negative 4.629629 okay but again I have to do step 3 which is taking the absolute value 
because I don't want this to cancel out. I don't want it to see what is the difference that exists in between them. I want to treat them as full positive values because again, it's the total distance traveled. Okay, and then our last one, if you wanted to see it, you would see that eight minus one would be seven, taking the absolute value. So all of these absolute values would give 0.629, and then seven. And you're basically just adding them up as if they were all positives. And you would get a yielded answer of 12.259, which you now notice that I rounded my final answer to three decimal places. And then, of course, included the units. Now, those of you that are in physics, and you might know this already, I'm going to allow you to use a shortcut to check your work if you want on tests. Um, it just won't replace your work, okay? Um, and again, those of you who are not exposed to it, I'm going to show you just real quick of how you can get this 12.259 with a calculator very quickly. Just a reminder, this second semester, we will be, be using the calculator quite extensively to make our lives a, a lot easier now that we've learned the fundamental concepts. Okay, so when you see total distance travel, just like we did in part E back here, or distance travel just by itself, you're going to interpret this shortcut. Okay, so the shortcut is the integral, which we'll discuss here very soon after this unit, the integral from 0 to 3 of the absolute value of v of t, basically the velocity function. Now, I know you don't understand fully what this means, or probably not even at all what this means right now, those of you especially not in physics. It's just saying I'm taking the summation, I'm taking the sums of all of those intervals between 0 and 3 seconds, and I'm trying to find what is that total distance traveled. You will understand this very soon, but for now, if you want to use this to check it on your test to ensure that you have the correct answer, you definitely may, okay? So let me show you what this looks like just real quick so that you can see that it, it does equal 12.259 meters. The velocity function from back here when we took the derivative was, let me come back, 6t squared minus 14t plus 4. 6t squared minus 14t oops, plus 4. Now it's very important that you put the velocity function into that equation. Don't put the position, don't put the acceleration. For this kind of question, it has to be specifically the velocity function. Now I'm going to quickly show you what that looks like on the calculator. Okay, we're going to pull up the calculator and I'm going to show you how to use the calculator even though we're not in that unit right now that is in regards to integrals of how you can do this quick check shortcut to see did I get the correct answer from what I did with all my long work if you will. Okay, so this is definitely, definitely allowable for you to use as a checkpoint system on your test. Alright, so let this come up. And when we put in V of T, we're not just going to put V of T, we're actually going to put in the entire function of 16 or 6T squared minus 14T plus 4. And I'll show you here in just a bit once it finishes loading how to put that in, how to put the absolute value from 0 to 3, what it all looks like. And you can, of course, look at this video when you're studying, getting ready for your test next week of how to actually use it with a calculator. Okay? All right, so here we go. Let's pull this up from 0 to 3. Okay, so add a calculator. And we're going to do this button right next to 9. And we're going to do the integral. So this second square right here um, on the, or the uh, second column, third row, we're going to choose that. And we're going to go from 0, so low to high. So from 0 to 3 seconds. And this is where my V of T specifically my v of t function goes. Now you can do it in terms of x or you can do it in terms of t, whatever you want. I'm going to go ahead and use t as my variable just so that you can see it's still interchangeable like with x as well. So minus 14t and it's going to be plus 4. And we're going to do it in respect to t. Okay, That means this t that I just put there at the very very end there, it's another way of interpreting this real quick. Let me show you what I'm talking about. It's another way of interpreting um, let me move 
this. When I did dy dx, this is in respect to x. So like if I said, what is the dy dx of 2x? My answer would be 2. If I said, what was the dy dx of 2y? This is implicit differentiation. It'd be 2y prime or 2 dy dx. I know it's been a while since we've done this with related rates and implicit differentiation, but I want you to know and understand at least why I'm putting t right there in this equation, because it's in respect to t. Now again, we will learn integrals next unit. Let me go back now to the calculator and show you what it would equal as far as an answer. Okay, So pressing the enter um, button, I want to just make sure I put it in there correctly. Oh, so I get 3. And I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I made the mistake because a lot of people made it, make it every year. I need to do the absolute value. Okay, Again, what did this just give me? It gave me the displacement. This alone right now is the displacement because it took this graph and it basically found whatever the graph looks like, the positive and negatives, they canceled out each other and it wanted to know what was the change in position. But if I go and I now, let me copy this entire thing. Um, let me go right there. So I'm going to copy it, but I'm going to do the absolute value of that V of T. Okay, so let me come over here and show you how you would do the absolute value. So at the very beginning of this equation, I'm going to press this button here, and then I'm going to do the absolute value sign. Okay, so let me go ahead and recopy this right now. So it'll be 6t squared minus 14t plus 4. I'll close the um, parentheses, or basically it's already closed by itself. I'm going to delete the rest that's on the outside still leaving that d of t there okay because we want it to actually account for that okay so now it'll do it right it'll be the absolute value of the velocity function in respect to t and you get this number here little recap i'll just grab that and this time press control enter and you get 12.259 this is that answer that we got when we did it by hand okay now i want you doing it by hand so you understand what you're doing for each section and so that it basically reminds you of why you're going to end up taking the absolute value because just as you saw me forget it's very easy to forget why we take the absolute value in that respect okay so when I take the absolute value let me go ahead and insert a page real quick when I take the absolute value of V of T okay so from 0 to 3 this is looking for the total distance traveled. The forward, the backward, it's accounting for it like you were traveling it all as positive distances. When I just do from 0 to 3 of this, this is interpreting for now displacement. So underlining um, concept is I want you to know the difference between total distance traveled and displacement. Okay, so now let's move on to our next example in your notes. It says the particle moves along a horizontal line so that its position at any time t is greater than or equal to zero is given by the position function that you see here, okay, same position, where s is measured in meters and t is in seconds. When is the particle speeding up? Slowing down, justify your answer. So here are your notes. Speed is different than velocity. Velocity has a vector where I can say I'm traveling at a positive 4 velocity or 4 meters per second. That means I'm traveling forward, throwing something up, or moving to the right. But if I say I'm traveling at a negative 4, it means something different from what we've learned now in this video. It means backwards, falling down, or to the left. Speed is basically the absolute value of velocity. So without that integral sign, just by itself, the absolute value of velocity is speed. So if I had a negative 100 miles an hour um, that I was traveling and I was driving that on the road, a cop would be driving right next to me and would give me a ticket because of the fact that I was speeding. My speed would be 100 miles an hour. Even though my velocity was a negative, my speed was still a positive 100. And if I was able to do that backwards, it would be pretty impressive, but I'd still, still get that ticket because my, I was breaking the speed limit. Okay, 
So now that you know speed, speeding up and slowing down have two different things. You're going to analyze the velocity and the acceleration. If they have the same signs, means they're helping each other, either in the positive or in the negative direction. And if something is helping each other, it's speeding up. It's when things fight against each other. Okay, so when one's positive or negative, or negative and positive, and I'm talking about, again, the velocity and the acceleration, when they are opposite, they're working, forces working against each other, almost canceling each other out, that means the particle will be slowing down. Okay, and you can think of this as if you have a positive velocity and you know you throw a brick with a positive velocity that direction but there's a negative acceleration like you could say there's wind blowing that velocity of that brick will slow down because you have two opposite forces you have a positive and a negative acting against each other so that's pr pretty much the gist and again if you had them both go in the same direction like you had a positive velocity but the wind was coming from the back it was like a tailwind that obviously would make it speed up because it's getting aided by that <clears throat> now that you know that I'm going to approach these kind of speed problems by not only finding the first but also finding the second derivative okay so the first derivative is 6t squared minus 14t plus 4 we know that from before whoops let me get that other color and then the second derivative as before is 12t minus 14 now what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly find the zeros of these functions. Now when I did this before, I found that these were my factors and they yielded these two critical point values of zero, um, v of t is equal to zero, at one third and two. I also found a zero by setting the second derivative equal to zero. The critical point for the acceleration is going to be seven six. Now remember this is all seven six seconds, one third seconds, and two. So one third is here, two is here, and seven sixths is right here. Notice the two graphs that I have. I've drawn you line graphs of not only the first, but also the second derivative. So the velocity and the acceleration are shown here. Now if I were to do it by itself and do it as scientists that you've done before, I know my one third and two are critical points for my f prime and it would look something like this like I'd have three intervals negative or positive negative and positive okay that's what you see over here positive negative and positive um, let me unhighlight that for a second I'll come right back to it the second derivative critical point was seven six this has a negative and a positive okay again negative and a positive revolving around that seven six the reason why I broke it up like this is because my approach is to interpret two things at one time and we've done this a little bit before um, basically I'm wanting you to learn it by this point at a full mastery level I'm gonna take vertical lines and I'm gonna make them go right through all of these critical points that means critical points of the uh, F prime of X and of the F double prime so the critical points of the velocity function and acceleration function and then all I'm going to do is just transfer that over so that I know between neg between one third and two everything's negative okay the reason why I have this third line here in the middle shows why I have to put these two as negative negative okay and then from there it's just easy because then I just line everything up and I can see that I'm going to be speeding up from one third to seven six okay so one third to seven six I'm speeding up because these two signs are the same they're helping each other the velocity or the acceleration is helping the velocity in that negative direction okay again that's over here from both are negative or both are positive and then two and two infinity so two to infinity they're helping each other let me get red actually as a highlighter for this one slowing down it will be from zero to one-third so from zero to one-third it's canceling each other out because they're opposite signs and from seven six to two seconds those are slowing down because they're canceling each other out because they're opposite signs now I'm going to show you again this is very important with it being closed at zero and it revolves around the fact just like the other one that it was starting when t was greater than or equal to zero so when the timer started again my velocity was already existing 
it was traveling forward because it was positive. The acceleration was in a negative direction. It was traveling backwards. So forward and backwards canceling each other out. That's why initially right at time is equal to zero, it's already slowing down. All right, so let's move on. Day two, it says the particle moves along a horizontal line so that it's positioned again. It gives my, me a position function. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna see part A says, when is the particle moving right or left and justify it. So when I wanna know if it's moving right or left, I'm gonna look for the velocity. Whoops, let me get that different color. The velocity function is, of course, the derivative of the position. So we get 3t, 3t squared minus 10t plus two. Now this doesn't factor easy. If you even tried it by factoring by grouping, it doesn't factor as easy as you would like it to. Okay, so when it doesn't factor as easy as you would like it to, chances are it's gonna be a calculator problem. Okay, so right now, again, there's a lot of calculator this second semester. I'm gonna show you what it is that you're gonna do as far as using our new TI-inspired calculators. We're going to input the position function into the calculator as f of x, or f of t. Now I'm going to choose f of t only because all these functions are given to us with t because it's in relation to time. Okay, So let me go ahead and put this as a function in itself. And notice that I'm going to put the position function, not the velocity function. So let me highlight that so that you can see it. I'm putting this function right here. Okay, So the position function is this original t cubed minus 5t squared plus 2t minus 3. Let me go to the calculator real quick and put that in. So I'm going to say t cubed. So t cubed um, minus 5t squared. It's going to be plus 2t minus 3. Now I pressed enter because right now I'm going to press control vars or variable. And it's basically accessing that store feature and I'm going to store my answer to reflect f of t. Okay, not t, not f by itself, but f of t. I want it like function notation so that I have a function and I can put in an input. And you'll see that it says done once it's stored it. Okay, so going back to the notes, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to solve what is the derivative, let me show you right here, what is the derivative in respect to t of the function that I just inserted after saving, and then I'll put when it's equal to zero, I'm basically finding the critical points because it doesn't factor out as easily. Now, the reason why I showed you on how to save it as f of t is because now I don't have to put this entire function ever again. It, 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 it does become a nuisance to have to retype that out all the time. I'd rather just say menu three, one, and use the solve feature and do exactly what I highlighted the derivative in respect to t of f of t okay so here we go I'm going to do the derivative so it's going to be this right here and I'll press enter it's in respect to t my function is f of t and those of you who have uh, 84's you cannot do this with the 84 and this is much much faster and much more convenient as far as um, finding it. Okay, so if I wanted to find the derivative, whenever it's equal to zero, I'm going to kick out of that parentheses, setting it equal to zero, and I'm going to solve for t, because that's the variable that I've initiated in my equation. Okay, so I'm going to put it comma t, and then I'll press control enter because I want the decimal places. Okay, so you see 0.2137, and you see 3.11963, which round to the answers that I've already written here. I'll highlight them in green. Here and here are my zeros. Now you can graph, you can use the table, or you can do what I'm about to do right now. Okay? Let me backtrack a little and say all we've done are find the critical points of my velocity function. Okay? I've set the derivative of my position equal to zero, and I have found it. It's basically like setting this guy right here. Oops, let me use a better color. This guy right here, equal to zero, and then solving for t. That's what j this just yielded by doing these steps right here, step one and two. Okay, so if I were to look at it like a number line, 
it looks like a number line where one of the critical points is 0.2137 and the other one is 3.1196. We need to test these three intervals to see when it's positive, moving forward, when it's negative, moving backwards, or when it's zero, that it's not moving at all. Well, we know when there's zero because that's the zeros that we found, that's when it's not moving. Let's now find this, uh, let's now check to see when is it going to be positive, when is it going to be negative. So, what I would probably ask you in class at this point is what number can you think of in this interval that is less than 0.2137? And the number that you should probably think of would be zero, okay? So what is it that I'm doing here in this step is that I'm trying to find out is my answer, which in this case is two, is it positive or is it negative, okay? It will be one of the two, okay? I get two is positive, negative five is negative, and 10 is positive. I'm gonna show you here in just a bit how I did that. But what it represents here is that whenever I'm looking, evaluating at zero, it's going to be a positive. So right here, wherever zero is at, it's going to be a positive. When I'm evaluating at one, it's going to be a negative. Okay. So that negative is going to be here whenever I'm evaluating a test point at one. And notice one is in between 0.2 and 3.1. Okay. And the last one is something in the last interval, like four. Okay. Putting in 4 yields a positive 10. I just need the positive part. So that shows me when it's moving forward, backwards, left, or right. Okay? All that. So my answer is going to be it will be moving right. Let me highlight this in green. It will be moving right between 0 and 0 0.214 seconds. Okay? And I get that from over here. And it will be also moving right. 3.120 because it's a rounded answer all the way to infinity and that's over here. Now I'm finding a mistake right now, I'm fixing it. When time is greater than or equal to zero, this should actually be a closed interval on zero. Okay, that's when it's moving right. Now when it's moving left is obviously going to be the other one, the other answer. It's going to be whenever it's between the two because that's when it was negative. So I would put use a different color, 0.214 all the way to 3.120 seconds. That's when it's moving left. And the justification is that the work that we've shown over here, that when the derivative, basically all this column right here is justification, when the derivative is positive or negative. Now, I'm going to show you how to put this into the calculator, this notation here, let me highlight it, that I was talking about of how do you get that 2, negative 5, and positive 10, okay? So I'm going to go to the calculator, and I'm going to press this key right next to number 9, or the book, if you will, and I want to know at a certain value what's the derivative, okay? So it's actually not here, I just remembered. I will find it like this. Menu, 4 for calculus, 2 for derivative at a point, okay? Derivative at a point. My variable is t. Okay, and the I'm only taking the first derivative. I'm not taking the second or the nth derivative. It's just the very first derivative. And the value that I wanted to evaluate it is um, of zero. Okay, so I will put zero because that was that first one that I was looking to see. Okay, so right here I'm trying to find the derivative of f of t. Okay, for the first one when t is equal to zero. So all I need to do is put f of t here. See, and this is why I showed you the benefits of this f of t storing feature. It's because now this would just yield a 2 just like that. And if I wanted to go up and just copy this, but change this 0 that I want to evaluate this now at 1, I get a negative 5. And I can go up. It's really handy and fast as far as not doing like a lot of busy work. And then 4 was my last test point, you get the 10. So the 2, negative 5, and the 10 reflecting the 2, negative 5, and 10 that I showed you from work. Okay? This all showed basically obtaining that, those signs that we wanted to obtain. Positive, negative, and positive. So that we knew when it was moving forward, backwards, or whatever. Alright. Find the distance traveled between 0 and 5. 
okay? This is just like the other one, it's just more practice. Again, I'm to interpret candidates test, okay? Interpreting candidates test, what did I do? I found the critical points and the endpoints of my position function, okay? So I, I took the derivative, I solved for the zeros, which when we solve for the zeros, we got these two numbers way over here, these 0.2137 and 3.1196, and I put those right here. The reason why I included 0 and 5 as endpoints are just like that last example. I'm taking the critical points and endpoints because it's interpreted as candidates test. Okay, putting in 0 into the S of T function, the original position, yielded all these positions, and then when I take uh, the difference of those positions, again, final minus initial, and let me go ahead and highlight that for you here. The first one here is this right here, negative point, or negative 2.791178 minus a negative 3, so I'm really adding that 3, I'm going to get that positive 0 0.208821. Taking the absolute value, I'm one step away. All I need to do is add this, this, and this after the absolute value has been solved. Okay? And you would do it the same with the other ones. You do between these two numbers, find the displacement, take the absolute value. Between these two numbers, find the displacement, take the absolute value. Remembering, displacement is final minus the initial. Okay? And I'm interpreting final as the number that has the larger seconds or the higher seconds, more positive if you will, minus the one that has the lower seconds input value. A quick check would be from 0 to 5 because it said total distance traveled, or in this case distance traveled, which of course is interpreted as total distance traveled. Don't forget the absolute value. Okay. So this would be the velocity function. Okay, so the velocity function we know is this guy right here, 3t squared minus t, 10t plus 2, and it would be from 0 to 5. And I'm going to show you real quick with the calculator how we get that 34.539. Okay, so let me go to the calculator real quick. And it's going to be the integral. Okay, and it's from 0 to 5. I know you don't know how to do this, or you don't understand this right now, the integral part, but I do... I do want to allow you to use it if you are able to use the equations to check your work. Okay, so 3t squared minus 10t, so the absolute value, let me not forget that this time. Okay, so 3t squared minus um, 10t plus 2. Plus 2. And then it's in respect to t, so I've got to put that t there. And then we can control enter, and we get 34.539, which of course is what we got over here, 34.539. Okay. Now, let me come back over here because some of you might be thinking right now, well, what if I took the integral, and I still did it from 0 to 5. However, without having to type in that you know, 3t squared minus 10t plus 2, what if I said that it's going to be, again, still the absolute value of the velocity, but I didn't type in the velocity function. I used my store feature that, you know, that you learned in this video, and I said, well, I know the derivative, so the derivative in respect to t of that initial position function, okay? And that initial position function, if I'm not mistaken, let me come back up here and let me make sure before I press enter on this. f of t was stored, yep, f of t was stored right here as the position function, okay? So if I were to come back at the very bottom and it's stored as the position function, I'm basically saying, well, the derivative of the position, okay, so the derivative of f of t is the velocity. So if I take the absolute value of the derivative of the position, it's the same as the absolute value of the velocity function. So again, going back in respect to t, I should get the exact same answer, and yes I do, because I t it's two different ways. I can either type all this in, which you'll get very tired of doing it throughout many problems, especially when, you have, when you're um, in time constraint. Um, this does prove to be better and easier, 
faster, especially if you're understanding what you're doing. Okay. Part C, find the intervals where the speed is increasing and justify your answer. This is another example of what we did before. I will show you how you can do it with the calculator though and save yourself a little bit of time. Speed is increasing basically when the acceleration and the velocity help each other. Okay, So f prime of x and f double prime of x, I'm trying to find when they help each other. Okay, so notice right here, positive, positive, and negative, negative. My answers are going to be 0 0.214 to 1.67. Okay, and this is open. It's basically saying from here all the way to here. Okay, and with open parentheses. And then from here off to infinity. All that is helping each other because they have the same sign. And you could show your justification would be that they have the same sign. I didn't write it out. Uh, I just ran out of room. But you would need to write it out. The acceleration and the um, velocity have the same signs. Okay. Again, let me let me stress that right now. I don't have a lot of room right now on these things, and otherwise, these uh, this video would be pretty pretty crowded. Um, the justification that you will need is the fact that let's like let's go to a when something is moving to the left or right you're just saying when the derivative is positive or negative so if it's moving to the right f prime of x is positive if it's moving to the left f prime of x is negative if it's not moving f prime of x is zero that's your justification part b your justification on here would be the fact that you're absolute uh, you're taking the absolute value of everything so your justification is the candidate's test work so part B, all of this is your justification. Now you can use the shortcut to check your justification, but you would need to show the justification to get full credit on your test next week. And then part C, the justification for that, even though I didn't write it out, you would write out when the acceleration and the velocity function have the same signs, both negative or both positive. Okay. Now let me show you real quick on how I got these values to show up as positive or negative. Okay, This one that I looked at, I'm trying to find basically uh, the signs. And I'm going to show you just two ways, just two examples of what I did. The first one that I did was I took the second derivative and I evaluated it at 1. So let me do that again. So right here, taking the second derivative in respect to t, evaluate at 1, yielded a negative answer. So that means right here, it was going to be going backwards as far as uh, um, being negative, if you will. Okay, This was at 1. So let me come back just a little bit. I just realized I'm, this was what I got. Okay, So whenever I was looking at 2, I wanted to see... Um, what was the sign going to be? So if you haven't figured it out by now, what I did here, this, these are second derivatives. So this second derivative is evaluated at 2. Basically what I did was something to the right of 1.666 and was something to the left of 1.666. That's why I chose 1 and that's why I sh chose 2. So when I chose 1, I was yielded a negative answer. So all that was negative. When I chose 2, I was yielded a positive 2 answer, so all of this was positive. Okay, So I could build my chart and see when things were helping each other, when things were hurting each other. Okay. Now with the calculator, real quickly, what I will do is show you how to do that second derivative. So it's just like the first derivative, only it's not going to be where it's d of dx or d of dt. It's going to be the second derivative button is here, 1 over to the right. When I press enter, whoops actually in the previous problem. I'll press enter. Again, this is the notation for the second derivative. And I wanted to evaluate it when t was 1. So let me put in respect to t. I'm taking the second derivative of my stored f of t function. And if I did it as an equation, it would look like this. But if I did it the way I'm trying to see it sign-wise, I need to remember menu calculus derivative at a point my input is t 
my value is the first value was one because we did one and two so I put one here but this time I'm taking the second derivative <clears throat> and here I'll just put the stored function of f of t okay and then when I press enter I get that negative four that you see right here okay and if I do it again with t is equal to 2, I would get a positive 2 value. So I can just go up there, copy it, makes it easier once you've done the first one, and then you get that positive. But knowing what this is interpreting is what it's all about. If you need to rewind this video, go ahead and do so. This will be my last example for this video. The multiple choice part. This is a, uh, an example of what we've talked about dealing with the calculator. A particle moves along the x-axis. Again, time is greater than or equal to 0. Its velocity is given by this function right here. That's v of t. And what is the acceleration when time is 4? So all I need to really do is take the derivative, which is v prime of t, or a of t, which chain rule wise uh, would simplify to, well, cosine's derivative is negative sine of the stuff. That 4.1 is constant multiple rule, so I can still write it down. But chain rule wise, I got to multiply by that derivative of the cream, if you will. So that's that 0.9 piece. Now, all this right here is my acceleration function. I can put in 4 because it's the acceleration evaluated at 4. So it's like a of 4 or v prime of 4. And I can put it right there where t is at, and I will get this answer. Now, chances are if this is a calculator problem, I want you to be faster than the average person. Way, way faster than the average person. With these new TI inspires, what you can do is you can quickly have this velocity function. Either you can store it or you can type it out and you can evaluate it at 4 so that you can see what is it going to be. Okay, so I've chosen time wise just to go ahead and write it out and then you would get 1.633. So the answer here would be C. Now let me show you how I did this real quick with the calculator and then we're done. This button next to 9. I'm going to take, oops, sorry, no, not that button. I'm going to take the derivative at a point. So it's menu for derivative at a point. My variable in this case was still t. Now it doesn't matter, it's interchangeable. You can put t or x. And the value that I was looking for, my at value, is 4. So when I come over here, I'm going to put 4 right there. And I'm wanting to do just one derivative. One derivative because that function that I'm putting into where this cursor is at is the velocity function. Okay, going back over here, they gave me the velocity function. So I'm only needing to take one level of derivative. So I'm going to put 3 plus 4.1 cosine. 3 plus 4.1 cosine. And it's of 0.9t. And I get this, hold on just a bit, I think I might have done something wrong here. Alright, so 3 plus the derivative of the velocity should show the acceleration at 4. And I should get 1.6329. But I got this answer here. Hmm, everything's in there. And if you're probably thinking about it right now, and if I didn't correct it, I'd probably give you bonus points, but I just figured it out. Home, five, two. Yes, this needs to be in radian mode. I'm still in degree mode because of being in pre-cal and whatnot. So changing that to radio, uh, radian mode, that's a good teachable moment. Then going back up here and doing this again, 1.6329, just like we got. So C is the answer. All right, that's all I got for this first video.